Now, I have the great uh, honor to welcome uh, our, uh, not for Dale, but Chip Herbert uh, keynote lecture uh, for uh, the premiere uh, 2019 20. Um, Mark now. I'll take just a moment to, to introduce him. Uh, Bart Ockerhaus is a, a young architect from Paris who started his own firm uh, five years ago. Five years ago this week, five years ago this month, five years ago this month. Um, he, he came out of a, a very, uh, his background is diverse and interesting, uh, but he was, he was uh, very much part of Renzo Piano's uh, uh, shop for a long time. Uh, but the interesting thing for me is that Bart was actually my thesis student. Yeah. We had a lecture here uh, a year or so ago, and I, I said, hey, maybe you know Bart Alkerhaus. And he said, yeah. He doesn't know more Albert House. He's like, he set up shop down the street from Renzo and he's kicking everybody's ass. And I said, well, yeah, good, that's, that's part. That's my student. She's not my student anymore. That was a long time ago. He graduated from the TU Bell. We couldn't remember if it was 2003 or 2004. 2004. Um, but he took an interesting path. Back then, people took paths to graduation. Uh, as a second year student, he saw the Saint Pompidou, Bogor, by Rinsha Piana. Right, am I telling this right? And he got so enthusiastic about it that he literally set himself on a path to work for piano. And uh, he just made it happen. Bert makes things happen. He, uh, he decides he wants to do something, and he just does it. Um, there was a competition, uh, not a competition, they were invited to a competition in 2016 at the uh, uh, Bordeaux uh, Biennale. And uh, they were the office that responded to the competition uh, so radically, so seriously, in a way where they rejected actually what was being given and they came with another project <coughs> on their own. And the awards committee had no choice but to initiate an award for them, which they called the Innovation Award. It was like, oh my gosh, right? They didn't meet our criteria. They exceeded it. They're the only ones. So we have to start an award just for them. That's my favorite award story. But they had to make one up. And it was innovation. Um, Award-winning office, uh, making waves, I have to say. And um, when we were talking recently, I even found that at one point, Bart took a small stint in London with HOK. Yes. HOK. Uh, you know, HOK, you won't know, is a major, one of the largest offices in the world, right? Um, these guys know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and. Um, he went there because they gave him an opportunity to run projects. He was young and was early in his career, and he was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to learn what they have to, to offer, and he did. And he went in, and he came out, and he went back to piano, and he's just, he's just, a, he's just a guy who makes it happen. And um, brilliant architects, you're going to see amazing projects, amazing sensitivity to the most subtle things in architecture. Uh, the ability to see things that people don't see. The ability to understand logic and alignment and clarity and cleanness in the design of buildings that just many people don't even see. And he sees these things quite naturally. It, he, just, he sees. And when I say take a sketchbook and draw, heart draws. Uh, take a step. He's my, he builds models. Okay, let me do it. He's a model guy. He will talk to you about this. So the drawing for Bart is actually model making. He does model making. I'll let you talk about that with your presentation. Um, but anyway, we're just going to be more honored to have you here. And I'm not going to wax nostalgic because that's where I'm going. Uh, but it is such an honor. And I'm so proud to welcome you, Bart. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much for inviting me here, faculty. Uh, it's a great honor to be here for me. It's very exciting. I think it's one of the first times I'm uh, actually presenting my own work and uh, uh, Renzo's work. So for me, it's, uh, it's also the first. That's not the first when we are students. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, I'll start with a little image and uh, Deborah did already the introduction, but this is this uh, slide that we're doing for uh, Deborah. This is Del. Uh, this is the the town where we studied, where I studied, where Deborah was my teacher. And I must have been Deborah's, maybe Deborah's oldest uh, student, because as Deborah said, I, uh, I think I only started studying uh, when I was 25 years old. I did some other stuff before. And then, uh, in the end, uh, after two years, uh, I left Rennes Pianos for an internship. Well, it should have been an internship for three months. Uh, it turned out to be more than two years. And then I came back. Uh, Deborah was there, uh, my first uh, uh, studio professor, so I must be over 30 years old already, yeah. something like that. And see, uh, for me it was very hard then to finish uh, university. The university is very exciting, you know, after a few years of work, it was very difficult. So she more or less dragged me to college, uh, which I am uh, eternally grateful for, and she helped me graduate. Uh, so thank you very much. I wouldn't be here without you. Um, so after, uh, after uh, university, I, I went uh, indeed to London for a year and a half. And then this guy called me up again, uh, friends of piano. Uh, he loves sailing. Uh, and he has been my, uh, my boss and my teacher and my mentor for more than 10 years. Uh, he's a very inspiring man, a very humble man. And he's uh, what I would call a, a craftsman. So he, what he really likes about architecture is how to craft and how the buildings are put together. And he's, he's a master in that and he, he teaches me a lot. So he called me back uh, when I was working, living in London to, to come back to Paris and to work on this project in London. This is the Sharp in London. Uh, it's the tallest building in now in Western Europe. Before the time it was the tallest building in Europe. It's about a thousand foot tall. Uh, it's a mixed use building. Uh, offices, houses, uh, hotel. Uh, Restaurants. And it's a built on top of a uh, actually on top of a uh, transportation. It makes it very exciting. So this building only has uh, 48 car parks. Um, great, great experience to work on. And after I worked on this one, I uh, Renzo had me work on uh, some beautiful projects around the world. Uh, I traveled around the world. We did the most amazing project for the most wonderful clients. But somehow, uh, somewhere, I will always had the urge to start for myself. I really, I really wanted to do that. So, uh, exactly five years ago, uh, to the week, by the way, not the month, the week. To the week. Um, I quit the office. I told my wife, uh, I have a daughter, six months old. I said, uh, let's quit the, uh, let's quit the piano and start on it. So, um, first thing I did, I rented a little office space, uh, in mostly next door to Renzo, small uh, four chairs, uh, three desks. Uh, you don't offer giving a printer, and, and I started. But where do you start? I mean, I didn't start with any, any uh, clients, and it was, uh, yeah, how do you start? But I think what was really important for me at that time is that, and what I learned the lesson, that when I was at Renzo's, I was always hoping or thinking, well, maybe there's a client coming by, or there's a person coming by, and he asked me to design his house, or he asked me to design a museum for him. Then I quit the office, and then I'll start my office, and it will be great. But I think you you really need to take a step, and you really need to uh, get out there and be available, and uh, let people come to you. So I think the step to get out of there, and people see that you're done uh, working with another firm, and you, you took the step, and you're, you're having guts to start working for yourself. Is that when people start to be confident in you to trust you with their project? Because for them also, it's a big risk. And, and, uh, yeah, willing to take risks. Um, so, yeah, saying that, uh, how do you get a client? So, uh, sometimes it's just purely coincidental. Uh, I was back in my hometown in Holland, uh, 25,000 people uh, town, and one of my friends has a hotel there. We were, we were shopping for a sofa because I was helping him do the interior, and uh, we had to buy a sofa. So we were in this shop, and I ran into this guy, and 
um, I knew him because he, he has been working on this project for over 30 years and I heard about it. And he hired, for me, one of the greatest architects of this moment, uh, Peter Zuntor, to work on this project. So I definitely knew about it, but I never met him. And he somehow heard about me. So he uh, knew I worked with Brent's Pianos. And he said, oh, uh, and I told him I just quit. So uh, he said, take a little sip. So he said to me, can I show you this project? I said, yeah, wow, why not? And, well, he showed me the project. Uh, it's, it's the Milfabrik Alive. He told me about it. He was now working. He, he uh, said he'd like to be the Zoom tour uh, from different in time frame and, uh, and other things, <laughs> as you have to, Peter. Um, he, uh, he was working with another architect, a big uh, international firm also. But this firm was about 300 people, and Peter Zumthor uh, has, has a beautiful little uh, office in the mountains of Switzerland, and there are 15 people max. Um, when, when he was working with Peter Zumthor, we'd call him up and ask him questions, and, and we'd talk about concepts, and uh, we'd also play together about what to do. And now he was working with this 300 uh, people architecture firm, where uh, when he was calling me, he got a lawyer, or a contract manager, or a project manager, but he never got the main guy, or, or randomly, or for 30 minutes. And he said, well, you work in a firm like this. Not totally true, but Lorenzo is about 150 people, and I think a bit more uh, of a human skill than that. But he said, you can help me on the client side, and you can help me deal with this contract, and deal with how I have to work with this client. That's fine. So I thought, good gig. I don't have any income. I can do this uh, two or three days a week, and then travel a bit around the world with him because we had to go to Berlin, we had to go to London, and it was interesting. But it, it went from bad to worse, and I don't know if it was me or uh, the client, but the client really didn't want to go further. And about two or three times he proposed to me uh, the party, you work with the French piano, you have one project of this size, you should be able to do this. And two times I said no, uh, and he was quite surprised, but the third time I couldn't refuse. And suddenly, um, I had to say yes, and there I was, uh, this small one-man band, working on one of the most interesting, I think, uh, in my honest opinion, project that was going on at the moment in Holland. It's the Bilfabrik. It's uh, in Leiden, which is a town uh, 30 kilometers uh, uh, south of Amsterdam. It's a typical Dutch town. It's, it's, uh, it's Little canals, little canal houses, but it's also one of the oldest universities in the world. So it's the third oldest university in town. Um, and this is the Mill Fabrik. It's laying on the old defense line of the city on the east side because the prevailing winds were from the west, and then the defense line wasn't uh, used anymore. They, uh, they demolished all, all the defense lines and started building these uh, 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 factories. <coughs> And um, it's been built, it's, it's a, what they call a mill fabric. It's a mill is flour in Dutch, so it's a flour mill. Um, it started about 130 years ago with the first building on site. It's about uh, 12 buildings. So you have to imagine it's, 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 the, the complex was in constant motion. So they always were building, adding, adjusting buildings. It's, it's always been a site in transition. And the buildings you find on the site, they represent really also the, 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 the period of construction. So there's cast iron uh, columns, there's concrete uh, in situ structures, there's steel and glass windows, uh, there's steel, steel structures. So from every period you will find uh, a building. And maybe from the outside, uh, the, the project doesn't look uh, as beautiful or as exciting uh, as you would see it. Uh, but it's a national monument, it's a, a Dutch industrial heritage. So it's, it's very, uh, for the Dutch, quite an important moment in time how it's built. And I think when, we, when I walked at first, when, when I visited all the buildings, I really found out that although the buildings on the outside are quite beautiful, the, the real beauty of all these buildings are inside. The bones of these buildings, the, the, whole, the structure, is just quite amazing. It's uh, concrete columns in situ, it's uh, cast iron steel. Still beautiful machines inside. 
this is one of the first examples in Holland of uh, uh, cement, cement domes. So, when I started this job, so now I was hiring people, of course, to, to do, help me, to do this project with me. And the first thing we did for the first three or four months, I think, was not uh, starting to design volumes or facades or, or, or uh, architecture on the surface. But we, we really started to analyze all the buildings. And we really, uh, we only we modeled everything in uh, Revit, so in uh, 3D software. We built physical models out of it just to understand all the spaces that were available to us. First of all, it's very complex. It was very difficult to only understand it in 3D. You really had to look at this project in, in 3D, in sections, and, and through models. It was really uh, one of the first things. So here we, we see part of our first studies about the buildings, and you see the different types of uh, construction, whether it's concrete or steel. And this holds a this lowest building on site, which is uh, a cave house, which is an engine, an engine. And during those three months, also the other, I think, really important step we took was to only look at the ground floor. It was the first time I visited, visited the site. I, as beautiful as it was, it was just one a forest of, of concrete columns. And there, was, there was no structure, there was no coherence. Because they built the buildings just because they needed them. They didn't build it with a master plan or with, a, with an urban uh, thinking mind. It was just a collection of buildings. And this needed to be one of the most uh, new, exciting places in the city. So it needed to be vibrant. And people should live there, work there, and go to a hotel, or go to clubs, uh, go to the art center. And my first, our first worry was, how do we get people inside? How do we connect to the city? So. We made big models of the site, connecting them to uh, the city, uh, trying to make sidelines, try to open up the buildings, try to identify each building separately. Uh, sometimes you have to demolish buildings, uh, because they were just too, it was too cluttered on site to, to, to really make it uh, clear. And I think it's a, it's a very important lesson that not always start straight away with this big idea of uh, drawing or having that is a great concept, I think, just analyze what you're there. Of course, it's an existing building, and sometimes you have a, uh, a new site, which is it's more different. But in this case, it was, for us, very important. Um, this is a model, uh, what you see here. So we found uh, four different types of buildings on site. Uh, one type of building was just uh, a building that was an office building. It just needed to have a restoration because it could function again as an office building. Then other buildings need to be transformed. So there were uh, storage, but they had windows, they had columns, they had ceilings, and they had walls. Uh, so you could, you could make a house out of it, or you could make apartments out of it. And other buildings you need to demolish uh, because of side lines, because of, they were uh, uh, not useful just to open up the master plan. And the third uh, type is that we also had to add program, we had to rebuild, because also our client, as passionate about architecture was, he also had some uh, economic reasons, so we had to add, in the end, also uh, some square meters or square foot. So it's about 600,000 square foot in the end, the program. And it's a very uh, mixed use uh, program of hotel, uh, apartments, office, uh, there's a spa well, there's a fitness of 30,000 square feet. There's an art center, there's the uh, ground floor, it's mainly a commercial space, make it a very vibrant space. And what you see in this model, everything in white is what we add, and everything in wood is what we either restore or transform. Uh, this is another uh, model we did, um, it's a bit later. Here, everything in wood is the first phase, we, we, we split up the, phase, uh, the project in two phases. So everything in wood is the first phase, it's, right now it's under construction. And everything in white is the second phase, and we are uh, in tender documentation right now. So I'll show you some images. Uh, it's not, well, we're not finished yet, because as Deborah said, the project takes seven years to finish, and we, we've been now four and a half years working on this project. Uh, it's 12 separate buildings, so every building is, 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 a, is a different project for us. So it will take uh, another three or four years to, to finish this. So we started with a um, parking garage, and the parking garage itself, I think it's a very beautiful design uh, uh, project, uh, actually, but um, here the complexity was that we had to build 
we want to build a parking garage on the ground because we didn't want any cars uh, on, the, on the ground floor. But in Holland, uh, maybe as you know, uh, Holland is built actually uh, on the sea level. So um, the problem we had here is we had to build on the water. So technically, uh, quite a, a challenge. We built in uh, the sheet by wall in first, and then the, we put in the, uh, the foundation piles. And then we started digging slowly. And at one point, the walls were too, the water pressure on the walls was too much, so we had to fill our hole with water. And then we kept on digging uh, well, on the water uh, to get all the, the sand and the mud out to, have, uh, to come to the level of the, of the basement park, the second level basement park. Um, and here you see one of the divers uh, that is doing underwater checking of the concrete. So we, what we do is we pour underwater, we pour the concrete, and it uh, actually uh, settles on the water, and we have to check for leaks, etc. And that's done by divers. Um, for us, it's very exciting. This month we're going to pump our water, and we will see, first of all, uh, the first, uh, yeah, the second round of the park. Um, I'd like to show you this. This was above the parking. Uh, we designed a park. And for this park, the client invited Pete Adolf, uh, a Dutch landscape architect, uh, to do the design. Pete Adolf uh, is he's one guy that I think is in his 70s. He lives in the eastern part of Holland, which is quite uh, calm and there's not much uh, going on. But he has he built a beautiful house for himself and a nursery. So he built he he, he grows his own plants and he tries to understand his plants. And he's doing this for 45 years all on his own. And he's building these most beautiful uh, parks and place around the world. I think the most common ones to you that you know is the Highland in New York, where he was the uh, botanist for the Highland. He did the Erie uh, Park uh, opposite the Art Institute of Chicago. But he, in his studio, in, in his little studio in Holland, he's all, all on his own, he's designing every uh, single plant uh, all by himself with his beautiful projects around the world. And what, what he's really good at, he, he designs with time. So as an architect, uh, we were discussing this yesterday, as an architect, we, we're not really designing with time. We build a building and it's finished, and maybe it's going to be transformed in 20 years. But he, uh, he, he designs with the season. So, in his, his, his uh, gardens look as beautiful in winter, or maybe even more beautiful in winter than they look in spring or summer. And he understands how the plants really look well together. It's quite an amazing uh, artist. There's a little model uh, about the garden. So as I said, there, there's, there's a few buildings that just need a transformation. This is an example of it. It's, a, it's an office building. And in our program, we uh, just made a startup for creative offices. And we re uh, renovated it. So this is the before and the after show. Um, we restored mostly the facade. So uh, during time, we put in aluminum framing, etc. We, we went to a manufacturer and tried to find the exact same profile of the steel facade. We had to, make, of course, make it uh, according to the new uh, rules and regulations. So it's, it's double glazing, it's insulated facade, it's all set with a simple uh, steel finish. Um, this building, we needed to transform. So this is a steel, uh, steel frame building with a brick facade that's actually the brick facade is not low bearing, so it's, it's just a, it's hanging off of the steel frame. And it's the, the beauty of this, again, in this building is mostly on the inside. The inside of the building is a beautiful steel frame with wooden floors and steel and glass windows. The trick here for us was to just try to, as much as possible, preserve this image. But according to new regulations, you have, you have fire regulations, so suddenly the steel frame uh, needs to be fire protected and you have to board it up either with a fire board or you have to uh, put in domestic paint. And the problem with intermessent paint in the Holland regulations is that if you have an intermessent paint, you need to have sprinklers. And sprinklers in Holland are not as uh, common as, first of all, as in, as in the United States, but also um, in housing it's almost never been done before. So here 
we put in sprinklers uh, to protect uh, the view of the, uh, the steel frame and to be able to preserve the wooden floors, and uh, the wooden ceiling. <coughs> For example, these are the steel facades. So this is a, at the moment it's single glazing, it's an old facade from the 1930s. But we want to keep it exactly the same. So what we did, we actually restored the facade and we, we found a method to put uh, double glazing windows in this facade. This is before, and this is after. So you see exactly the same frame with exactly the same thicknesses, but it has now a double glazing. Very thin double glazing. This is the result when it's when it should be finished. This this building is probably finished in uh, January. On top of this building, uh, we added some uh, program. Here we decided uh, to create a volume to uh, to connect the two, uh, all two two buildings together. And the way we we thought about how do you add to all this this architecture that you find. What's the common denominator of all the buildings? Because some are brick buildings, some are steel buildings, uh, some are concrete buildings. How do you find a, a form of, when you add to this uh, new buildings or new structures to decide what's the common thing? And all these buildings are, are built as a factory. So they're built uh, very functionally without any ornament. They had to form uh, storage, for example. Okay, they made mushroom columns because that was what you did. But it was ne never out of ornamental, it was always out of function. So we decided that all our additions should at least be functional, they should be quite pure in their expression, and they should show what they were doing. So here uh, we had to have a, a quite a, a light construction uh, on the top because the building couldn't hold much. And uh, because of what the steel building, we decided to put a steel building uh, on top of the structure. Uh, but we decided to expose the steel structure. So the structure is on the outside. It's an exoskeleton structure, which leaves a total floor plan of the uh, penthouse uh, at 30 feet. Um, and again, <coughs> technically, that's quite complex because now you're still on the outside, you need to connect it to the floors on the inside. So there's a, there's a thermal bridge, so the cold from the outside going to the inside. So technically, we have to go to quite some hoops to achieve this uh, vision. Here it's being built, so it's starting in the steel frame now on the building. And here you see the uh, first thing. So it's really, what, this is all it is. It's, it's a glass box, it's still a glass box on, on a building, and that's, that's what you try to have. And there's nothing else, so we have a clear floor plan, except for, of course, the core. Um, this were actually two penthouses, uh, a couple, uh, local couple bought it as one penthouse uh, for themselves to retire in. And they asked us also to do the interior, which for us was, was a great thing. Not only we're now doing uh, the architecture of this building uh, on the outside, but we also could work on the inside. Uh, so this is one of the first uh, views of the space, which is uh, the floor ceiling height of the building is about 12 foot, and we have some low height spaces, so this is a 24 foot high space, which overlooks the city of London. So another typology of building uh, on site is, um, is, is a new build. And again, for this new build, we, we went the same way. So we, we said, OK, it needs to be a pure functional building. Uh, it's an apartment building. But we like to express the material of the building. We like to express uh, the structure. So what you see here is the facade. It's, it's a concrete facade, but it's not a cladding. It's actually holding up the building. So, that, that helps in two things. It clears the ground and the, the floor plan. So there's no columns uh, at all in the floor plan. These are just the dividing walls and the core. And on the outside, there's this columns. They're only spaced uh, almost as a facade within uh, five feet apart. And the columns are uh, very slender. They're uh, one foot by eight inches, more or less. Uh, all the way up to the structure of the building. Then at the ground floor, we recess uh, it a bit. So we really show that the columns are, are holding up the building. And we recess the ground floor facade a bit, so it also gives way to prominent uh, underneath the building. Um, this is the first study we, we did. We're doing uh, about the concrete facade and the infill of the glass and, and the uh, opaque panels. The 
because we had to add like panels because of dark regulation. We need have all gas uh, because it's a new building. You can have a all gas building anymore in all of It's very it's quite complicated. And again, because we have the, the concrete on the outside and the floor on the inside uh, that should be connected to the column, we have this problem with this thermal bridge. We found a detail uh, where we put a very minimal steel connection point between the concrete and the uh, inside and concrete outside. So we don't have any uh, thermal uh, connection. So this is the result. It's quite a slender building. It's three volumes, a bit like the mill fabric. It's put together uh, as three volumes. And it's, very, it's quite a, almost a little, little bit of a bridgeless building, but uh, with something this is the result we wanted here. Yeah. This is going to be built, but the, we start building this in uh, January. Uh, I'll show you one more. Uh, we also had to, uh, when we were analyzing the buildings, one of the buildings is a silo building uh, to hold all the flour. Um, we found out that the silos were spaced almost uh, in a regular rhythm of 12 feet apart, which is perfect for hotel rooms. Hotel rooms are between 10 and 14 foot wide. So uh, we decided to put the hotel in this building, so we only had to add the floors. And we had to carve out the door, the floors, etc. But we didn't have to destroy the beautiful silo buildings, and we could use them uh, in our architecture. So and also on the ground floor of those silos, uh, we could use this uh, as a lobby. So what we're uh, trying to do here, is, uh, in the sense, is that you have the hotel rooms above, and then we we, had, we, um, we gave away the first two floors of, of, above the silos for technical space. So all the ducts and all the technical uh, things uh, from the hotel room, from the restaurant above, and from the sky bar above uh, would go down, but would be collected uh, at level two, and then um, <coughs> moved to the side. So therefore, we could clean a totally clear uh, ground base and uh, keep the silos uh, uh, totally intact. In the and again, um, for the hotel, we also then designed the interior of the hotel. Uh, so again, for us, it, it's, it's a dream come true because you're, you're, you're doing it's the whole architecture, you're doing end building, and yet you have to be able to design uh, the interior. So here, uh, the client also asked us uh, to go a step further and to design the typeface of the building, of the, of the project. It's going to be uh, one, uh, one uh, project in the end. So we did research of all the typefaces we found in the old silos, and from that we distracted our kind of common denominator uh, of uh, letters and uh, uh, numbers, and uh, we call it the Milford typeface. I think in the end, uh, what we're trying to do, because it's 12 different buildings, um, and 12 totally uh, different architectures, but in the end, I think what we're trying to achieve and what we're, I hope we're achieving, is that it's, it's one complex, it's one unit in the end. I think we should share it quite well, but it all goes very well together. So now I have a project, my dream project. I have 10 people staff, so I have to move offices. So we found very quickly after six months we found this beautiful office space in the heart of Paris, again, uh, very close by in the And um, the, uh, uh, it's an old, it's only 1,500 square foot, but it's an old lampshade factory and we have to redo it. Uh, but we're moving in. And most proud of what we're achieving there is that I finally have my own model shop, or we have our own model shop, and I think I've ever said it, but, uh, during all my studies and everything, uh, model making for me is the main tool uh, to design. And we're not only making models uh, to impress clients or to convince clients that something needs to be done. We, we really use model making uh, for studying, for uh, research, and understand the spaces. So um, having this model shop and having a professional model maker working with us to do this is, is really great. I mean, we have two model shops actually in the office. This is the professional model shop with all the woodworking machines, and then we have a second model shop where the architects 
I work with the uh, 3D printers, laser cutters, and uh, more the foam works. But um, again, I, found, I think architects um, architects have a lot of tools in the toolbox. You know, you can use a lot of tools, and they should have a lot of tools in the toolbox. So not only uh, is there a set uh, on the hand drawing or hand sketching, uh, it should be CAD, it should be uh, it should be model making also. So I think try not to uh, try not to limit yourself to only being excellent in 3D render or or, or uh, yeah. good. Hmm? Or BIM. Or BIM. Or BIM. But BIM helps. I mean, we couldn't have done the mental brick without this. But we couldn't have done the mental brick either without models. And so you have to do both. And don't try to limit yourself to one, one technology. I think uh, keep sketching and, and, and keep modeling. Yes, for us, it's the most important tool in the So we have our model, we have our project, and we have our office. Uh, and we have to start. But now, we are worried because what happens if the project stops for certain reason, temporary or indefinitely? What happens if my client goes bankrupt? What happens if he doesn't like us anymore? And he goes to the next architect, and I suddenly have this expensive office with 10 architects in the moment. So um, I have a favorite of favorites, it's in between Renzo's office and my office, and I sit there every day uh, having uh, my lunch. And the partners of Renzo's office always come by. And sometimes it's quite handy. And I didn't plan on purpose to be so close to the office, but uh, one day, uh, one of the partners of Renzo came by, and he was working on this project. It's the Parisian courthouse in Paris. And I've been working on this uh, while at Renzo in the uh, competition phase. And he, he really needed help. And uh, he said, can you help us? And part of my team is ex and pianos, and part of my team also working with project, so it was quite well. So yes, perfect. So now we find ourselves working on uh, the uh, Palais de Justice in Paris. It's, uh, it's the second tallest building inside the period in Paris. It's uh, 500 foot tall, and it's about uh, 15,000, uh, 1.5 million square feet. Get my square foot. I'm, I'm not going to show you the whole project, but what's interesting about the project and how we won the competition, or how Renzo won the competition, is that um, the, the courthouse has a lot of offices for the magistrates and for the judges uh, to proceed all the documents, and then they have a, a space where the courtrooms are where they receive the public. And in Paris, there are totally different regulations in fire and uh, travel code, uh, working code. So you can't really make them in, into one building. So all the Competitors made two buildings, one high rise and one low rise, which was on the, uh, uh, the courtrooms. And what we decided to do is to put the high rise on top of the low rise. They still are two independent buildings, and they have just one connection, uh, uh, which we could uh, control by the fire. And it's never been done before in Paris. And one of the reasons I think uh, Renzo in the end won this competition is because of all the logistics and all the the back and forth of the magistrates into the courtrooms was so much easier on this one. It was so much more efficient building. I think, uh, so here you see the, the high rise and the low rise. I think another interesting uh, thing about this competition is Renzo, when he does a sketch, he almost always sketches at least some plants on the roof. Most of the times he sketches uh, trees on the roof. And I always think I see the sketch and I got that. We're going to be that way in the engineer lab. We'll never see this. And uh, again, here in this competition, huge streets, almost a forest on the roof. And I was like, well, never in our life we're going to get this. But uh, on the contrary, uh, on every flat roof of this, uh, this building, and this is a high rise building, there's a little forest. And so here we are on the, we are about 75 feet above ground, looking at the high rise building. So we're on the podium. Again, we are on the podium. But even here on the top roofs, you have uh, this skyscraper where you actually can go out and you can, you can smoke a cigarette, although somebody smoked a cigarette and then we had a little fire, so I'm not sure if they can still smoke a cigarette. <laughs> uh, that was the idea. And this, again, this is, at, uh, this is at 400 feet. It's quite exciting. 
We were mainly involved in the interior for this project. This is the courthouse, courtroom. And this is the main uh, entrance lobby, which is uh, uh, one of the main uh, ideas about the entrance lobby. I think it's one of the qualities of entrance work. It's always this transparency. So you always want to uh, show what's inside. And um, of course, as a courtroom, they want, uh, they want brick walls or concrete walls to, for attacks, and, or et cetera. And Renzo argued, no, we, have, uh, we would have glass, we would have glass on ground floor. So in the end, we got it. And, and the trick here was to move all the controls and all the security offside. So although this looks like the main entry, the main entry is a bit on the left. And then you move in and you come into this grand space, which is naturally by our skylights. So above the skylight, next to the skylights is the, are the trees. So then the next step, you have, we have our decent uh, income streams and we have our revenue control. We have our office, but now we need to work on our portfolio because as I said before, a uh, uh, project takes seven years uh, to finish. At least the project we were working on at the time. So when can we show what we're doing? When can we, even now, I'm doing these lectures five years ahead, and I can't, I can't really show you any built work. So now we have to build something, at least do something. So we decided to do different scale projects uh, in a very short time frame. And I'll show you three of them. The first one is uh, for the Biennale of Lyon. It's, uh, it's an installation for the now. We, we sent in uh, our proposal and we got selected and we got uh, five months uh, between the selection and, and to do the completion. It's an active installation, so we asked the, the visitors to participate in it. And it's a bit inspired uh, on two things. First is uh, the serious games of Goodman's and Fella. And the second is uh, my daughter's uh, Sim City. <laughs> yeah. uh, we build a real life same city. So uh, the idea is that people during the 10 days of the UNDB and Ale, they had wooden blocks and every wooden block which represents 20 people, 50 people, and they had to construct the city along this little river. And by constructing either close to the river or in the woodlands or making a high rise, that would have con consequences. And those consequences would uh, uh, cause a catastrophe or at least an uh, environmental alert. And they had to react and find a proposal to uh, move that alert. It looks a bit complicated at all. But um, for us, the idea was that uh, there's Earth Day. This is the day where Earth uh, uses up, we use up all the resources of Earth. And somewhere about in July, and the idea was we should push Earth Day within those 10 days uh, to um, uh, the 31st of December. And what's, what's interesting for us in this is that um, we're working with uh, not only uh, uh, our team, and we're doing this, this research into graphics and into videos and projections, but we were working with university students, uh, we're working with software engineers uh, to get this done. And for us, it, it was really a, an interesting lesson. So not only doing focusing on, on this big project, but also get time to actually do some stuff that you normally enjoy during university. <laughs> the second project uh, I'd like to show you, is, uh, I'll show you very short, this is Deborah's project she talked about. It's close to uh, a university project of mine. University projects I think are always very conceptual, or very uh, clear. Um, the project here was to uh, uh, construct a uh, carbon neutral uh, Cartier, uh, Porter, in, um, in Bordeaux in, for 2050. So again, it's, 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 a, it's a competition of ideas. We're not going to uh, get a bill. We're not, we don't get much money now for it. But uh, it's for the Biennale of Lyon, and we, we get exposure, and there's a book that we publish, so we decide again to take it on. The competition side was very small, it's only the, the small buildings uh, on the top. So we figured if we want to do a carbon neutral uh, uh, community on that small piece of land, 
only seven or eight people could ever use that because we couldn't find enough land to produce, uh, to offset the, the carbon that we're still using. So we decided to enlarge the site and make it actually much longer. So from the river Garonne to the lake on the, on the bottom left, uh, we took that whole site and we cleared it out of all the buildings that were there, except for some buildings we thought we could use and, and regenerate. Of course, we reused, reused all, the, all the buildings. But, and then we concentrated everything on one line. So everything is on one line, uh, living, uh, production, uh, transport. And around it, we used the, the, the cleared up lands for forest, uh, for agriculture, and for leisure. As you said, because we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, follow the rules, we got the, honor, uh, we got the innovation. One thing, we, when you're doing these things, you also start uh, finding new techniques of presentation. So one, this is a good one to keep in mind. Uh, you just take an old painting, and this is a painting of a Dutch uh, landscape uh, painter in the 1700s, and you just put your project in, so then you don't have to do all the rendering of the landscape. <laughs> <laughs> Also safe cost. <laughs> um, this is a project very close to my heart, and I think exemplary for uh, what we're doing. Um, it's the Bamboo Theater. Um, we were asked by a, a Dutch uh, amateur company to build a theater for them. Uh, it had to be uh, assembled and reassembled, so it's a temporary theater that we build every year in three or four days and have a play, whatever play they were, uh, they were doing at the time uh, for 10 days and then uh, left again. The, the big challenge here was they asked us in January and had to be on site in June. Um, we had to work with amateurs, there was no budget at all. Uh, to be all the budget, well, there was no budget to build it, there was also no budget for the architect. So the three projects I just showed you, uh, we got about $5,000 for all these projects together. So that we, um, that doesn't really matter. I think we put the same amount of energy and time in these three little projects that we put in the middle of it because it's very important uh, to do this uh, for the office, also for the team to, to switch scales, to, to do this uh, uh, small exercise in, in architecture and, and liberate your mind. Um, so the budget was uh, small and working with amateurs was a challenge. The other challenge was that it's a temporary theater, so it had to be built and rebuilt. And we didn't know for which place, place it was built. So we, we decided to make a theater in the round, uh, which is a, it's a beautiful, almost English old style theater, almost a Shakespearean theater. It's, it's very intimate, the theater in the round. And the advantage is that you can take away uh, seating for the audience and make place for uh, for musicians or for, for stage, so you can enlarge the stage or make the stage smaller. You can even make the stage in the middle. So by having the smaller configuration, uh, you would have uh, uh, the flexibility to host several places. So this is the first construction. It's, uh, it's an almost circus tent like uh, idea. We have a main, a main steel uh, centerpiece on which the bamboo is connected. And in the beginning, we put it up with a, with a pole, with a steel pole. And then we, we fold out the bamboo and we put the next pole, and then we fold out the other bamboo and put the next pole underneath it. And it's, it's built in, in three or four days. The bamboo structure is built in two days, and then we have to uh, connect the, the tissue and uh, fabric on it. And the main, the difference, uh, what takes time is then the lighting, etc. But the structure itself is, is quite fast. And the foundation is just concrete plates. And this is here it's in the center. So here you see the steel piece in the middle, uh, and the bamboo that folds open. And at the end, as a circus stand, we take out the middle pole, and because it's a circle and it's all so connected, it cannot go anywhere. Anymore. This is a beach. So we're getting there. We, we're building a portfolio, and we have two projects that, that make money. 
now we want to start looking at future projects. And the way to start looking at future projects, and especially in France, is to do uh, competitions. Uh, you're sending your portfolio, and you're sending all your, uh, your turnover and all the books, and your licenses, and then they select uh, five architects, and then they can do a kind of paid competition. Our problem was that we were too we were too young and not uh, we didn't have any portfolio or any turnover to do the big big projects that we wanted uh, uh, the theaters and, and the courthouses and the museum and the small projects were too small for us and, and we couldn't really uh, put that effort in, 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 into that so we decided to go the path of uh, open competitions. A friend of mine said once, a uh, friend architect, he said to me, you better, the money you invest in the competition, which is sometimes fifty, sixty thousand dollars uh, for the team and for the renderings and, and the work you're doing and all the presentation material, you better take that money, bring it to the casino, put it on a number, <laughs> <laughs> the chance that you win and the profit that you make will so much is so much larger than entering any open architecture. But um, we did it anyway. So I'll show you a few. Uh, um, this is a, a, in Seoul, Korea. It's a musician center. We got an honorable mention. Uh, Beijing, China, and shopping mall. Honorable mention. Uh, Kangas, uh, music hall. I don't think we made it to the first 25, actually. Um, this is the music hall again. Uh, project in Amsterdam, uh, renovating of old silos, first 20, maximum. Project in Germany, can't even remember uh, where we got. Project in France, uh, housing, we came in second. Another project in France, rehabilitation of an office building, we came in second. Uh, museum, I think we came in with the first 20 again. An uh, office space for a major Silicon Valley company in Paris. We came in second here. And this is the competition we just finished uh, two, a month ago or a month and a half ago. We just started to resolve. Out of 250, we became 12 or 13. So. Um, this is an interesting competition. Um, there's two stories about this competition. The first story is that um, well for, for this competition, you had to do a request of qualification, so you had to send in some ideas uh, and uh, your portfolio, and then they would select five architects. And so we were called up by a local, this is in Toulouse in the south of France, we were called up by this local uh, developer, and he said, uh, would you want to do this project with us? And we said, yeah, great. So we went to Toulouse and visited him, he came to Paris and we had a nice day, and then after dinner I asked him, so why do you, why did you choose us? I mean, uh, how did you know us? How did you find us? He said, well, so this is a site about uh, canals. And, uh, it's, it's next to the canal that we be in, in France, which is the canal that goes from the Mediterranean to the uh, Atlantic. So he said, this is about canals. And you're from Holland. So I thought, I look for an architect from Holland. And then I found you in Paris. It's great. You speak French. And sometimes, you know, you don't know. Turns out we were about to win this project. Uh, I think we were winning. We got some rumors that we were winning this project. And then in the no local newspaper, uh, there's an article or some. They found some tweets that our client uh, tweeted to the jury uh, during uh, the jury sessions about this project, uh, which is not very ethical, I think. So we decided to retract uh, ourselves. Uh, six months of work uh, down the drain, uh, thanks to the client. Uh, and there's still no result uh, of the competition. But then sometimes things uh, go for the better. One day I'm in Cannes, in the south of France, and there's this huge uh, uh, real estate fair. So all those people, all real estate people from around the world go. So I decided also, it was my first year there, and I'm having lunch. And next to me is a guy, and he's sitting there, we're having lunch. We don't even have lunch together, he's just sitting next to me, and he starts talking. And he says to me, uh, So I said, What are you doing here? I said, Well, I just came with this uh, to architect, he's, he's, he's quite a famous French architect, and uh, I wanted to give him this project, but there's just no chemistry between us, so it doesn't work. Do you know any good architects? <laughs> <laughs> 
no, but I'm one. And, uh, <laughs> so he, um, he invites us to do a competition. So he doesn't give the project straight away to us. Uh, so we're doing this competition and we win it. And it's a, it's a beautiful site, it's, it's over here, looking the Mediterranean, it's in between Canaanese, and it's an it's a, it's a office and housing campus. It's called Sophia Anatolis, it's the friends, like to think of the French Silicon Valley. Um, and we are, uh, yeah, we're doing it. The site is beautiful, the site is, 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 is sloping rolling hills with just uh, nature on it. So when we, we, we approach the site, we, our strategy is just try to work as much with nature as possible, try to integrate in the nature as much as possible. So we, we do a lot of model studies and we do a lot of sketching about how can we integrate and, and not uh, ruin this beautiful site. So the first thing we did, all the parking had, had to be on the ground uh, as, a, as a requirement. So the first thing we did, we built a park on the background but then reconstructed the hill. So the, the hill, we never dug into the, the rocks to make the park. Then the second is that the nature, we try to get, get as much in as possible. The way to do that is actually following the slope of the buildings, the uh, slope of the, of the hill. And in the end, we, I think it's a beautiful campus of uh, little buildings that where the real nature comes in and then in between the buildings, you create these outdoor spaces where there's parks and people can meet uh, between, the, between the work and, you see the parking built on site and then we built uh, on top. So some trees have to go, are still in the ground, of course, and you have to space them. But it's actually, actually quite nice because then you have some, some, you have a tree in the park, which is, which is a good idea. So here you see that nature is coming in and then we create this little patio. Uh, so I think that's it's been our office how we, we, we approach projects and I think I like to finish with three buildings, um, three little three projects, it wasn't little. Uh, but it, it shows with our approach to architecture. And the first project we just took on in July, so it's very preliminary status. But it shows uh, I think our way of thinking how we look at uh, what's there on site? What's the change looking on site? How can we work with the things you have? So we have a client that wants to shut it. It's for three uh, families, so it's, uh, it's for three different people that work in there, uh, live in there. And the first thing we do is we start analyzing all the shadows in Switzerland. And every little town or village in Switzerland, especially in the mountains, they have the typical uh, vernacular of architecture. Just the roof is pitched a bit differently, the balconies are, are, are just a bit differently. So we do we first go sketching, we, we, we look at it, we say, look at this, it's pitching outwards, it's strange, and we've seen it before. Um, and we, we try to, to, to work with this. Then we pick three aspects of it uh, which we like. So the first is some, some buildings are very, the wood is very, very vertical. And this verticality will help us to connect the three uh, levels of our shell at the end, because it's three different um, uh, couples. And we want to make three different uh, uh, spaces of living. And they also want the top couple want only a glass building and the bottom <coughs> one to be very enclosed, which is lucky for us. So we decided to keep a kind of vertical structure to connect those three uh, uh, layers. Then we found, what I said before, that the chalets have a typical, like, it's a layer building. Uh, underneath was the kettle, then the family was on the first floor. And then there was a haystack on the top floor. The haystack was, well, it was a, just a wooden slab south, uh, often the uh, just for ventilation. And so these three aspects then combine it, combine it to the chalet, which is the vernacular of the chalet is very uh, almost uh, local, but we really interpreted the way of uh, building and constructing to a project we think will be. Uh, Innovative in that sense, but still fitting in, in, the, in the local vernacular without trying to make a false prestige of it. Other thing we are doing, and this is more of a thing, but, uh, we're trying to work with the height, and so the living spaces are, are 
render spaces that we do the split level, where the sleeping spaces are, are very intimate and very uh, 10 foot tall, and the living spaces are up to uh, 14 to 16. So these are the first sketches of the uh, presentation to the class. <coughs> The second building I'd like to show is a building I didn't show you before for the mill of the mill. It's uh, the mill magazine. The, the mill magazine, the magazine is the store, the warehouse, so it stored the flour uh, of, the, of the factory. So this is mushroom columns, it's concrete mushroom columns, it's uh, massive. And if you look at the building, I mean, the outside is it's not a very spectacular building. The inside of the pit is really in, 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 the, in the concrete columns and in, in the concrete uh, roof and ceiling. So we decide that that's what we want to show. That's the, the essence of the building is the structure, it's not the facade. So we decide to peel away the facade and we expose the structure. So we, need, we need to become a, a residential building, a lot of space living. So we need to have a, a thermal facade in here. So what we decide to do is when we have the concrete structure exposed, we have a glass cube inserted into the concrete structure. So the first meter and a half, so the first five feet, are, are concrete, and you see it from the outside, and it gives a new identity to the building. And then behind it, we have the uh, residential unit. And here you see concrete uh, structure. But what, what's difficult now is that suddenly you have concrete going from the inside to the outside. And again, uh, what I said before, in the steel building and the concrete residential building, we have technology to work with them. But here, we have an existing structure. We cannot use this complex new technical joints to make it. So we have to find those solutions. Uh, because the facade, we like, really put like the facade in the middle of these two columns. And the, the, the right part would then be the, the balconies, and the left part would be the interior. So um, what do we hear? Idea. So this is one sketch of when we talk to engineers. So one of the ideas is just that um, we have the columns, and in between the columns, there's not much uh, structure needed uh, because the, the, the columns work between the columns. The, the floor works like the kind of theme. So we decide to cut away as much as possible the concrete from the facade line as possible to have as less material as possible to transfer the, uh, color, the heat from the outside, uh, inside the outside and the cold from the outside to the inside. So we, we, you can see them right on the slide on, on different nodes. Uh, we, we take away the concrete, we fill it with insulation, but that's not enough. Uh, we still have a cold bridge problem. So what we do now, we use the system which is uh, almost like an uh, underground floor heating system. And it's, uh, it's, it's water filled. So this is, um, we, we, have, we have ground source heat pumps that pump hot water uh, into the, the system and they actually heat up the concrete, uh, the concrete structure. The ground source, the water is free because it, it's coming out of the ground. Now it's the electricity to pump it up, which is still free. So we put solar cells on the roof pump up the water, so it's, uh, it's going to be a sustainable solution of heating up the concrete in the winter time uh, to have no, no problem. And what we wanted to achieve is that the concrete roof, the cast and situation concrete roof, goes directly from inside to outside and is just a glass of salt that's in between. Uh, the renderings are not that great because a beautiful concrete roof is not very good rendering, but you get a, get a bit of an impression what it uh, would be like. And this is the ground. The last project uh, I'd like to show you is again in a totally different uh, way of the, of the world. This is uh, Peru, Cusco. Uh, we're looking at the city center of Peru with the Plaza Mayor in the middle and the, the mountains in the back. Our site is, is a very dense site on a very hilly slope, but it's, it's very close to the center. It's a very uh, popular uh, place to live in. And our client wants a small apartment complex of uh, seven uh, or eight apartments. This is the view again from the side uh, towards the Plaza Madrid. Um, 
it's very interesting to us because suddenly we face we, we, totally different climates and uh, totally different way of building buildings and building techniques that are available in Europe are definitely not available uh, in, in uh, Cusco or in, in, in Chile. So we are, uh, for us, it, it's a great challenge. The first thing we do when we look at this project site is that we try to we split up the buildings in two because um, we need a lot of uh, natural air into the, into the apartment, natural light into the apartments. So we, we split the two buildings in two volumes. And we connect them with a staircase uh, to, uh, to enter the buildings. So we don't use any space inside the buildings uh, with staircases with vertical circulation. We just have it uh, outside, and that, therefore we can get the natural light. Uh, on top, we make rooftop terraces and uh, sort of beautiful view outside towards the center of Cusco. But one of the interesting ideas for us here is that we, we, we try to, it doesn't matter where we work in the world, we try to research uh, new materials and new ways of building. And we, again, we'd like to make this a sustainable building. So we're looking for uh, sustainable insulation materials. And we come up with the idea of uh, handcrete. And handcrete is a this kind of insulation material where you have the hand plant and you have some lime and you mix it with water and it becomes uh, an insulation material. And it's beautifully layered. So you have a beautifully layered because you see where you, where you pour the lime on the hand and you see those layers almost like when you, you pour uh, concrete or make a rent uh, wall. And we decided to use it as a facade and as an insulation for the building. Um, another inspiration we have then is that low, close by this is beautiful colored mountains. These mountains are, are stained over millions of years uh, by sulfur, uh, iron, and, uh, and uh, copper, I think. The three colors, the yellow, green, and red. And we, 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 we love the idea of at least coloring a little bit of uh, our wall in these layerings. So we want to mix this with the, uh, the handcrete. These are some, some images of a local market in Cusco where you have these beautiful pigments and, uh, to do this uh, with. One big problem, hemp is an illegal substance in the uh, <laughs> <laughs> So our client wasn't really uh, getting warm on our idea. But he was also very uh, willing to think with us and he, he found itchy. Itchy is a local plant, it's widely available. And right now we're testing uh, itchy quit. We uh, did not yet uh, copyright it, but um, we are hoping to make uh, our installation. Um, I think what I, I hope to try to show you today is that our office uh, works on uh, projects from every scale, uh, from the very small scale or the very temporary scale to large uh, scale projects. We try to work uh, around the world on, on different sites. And we, uh, we try to have uh, different uh, functions for our buildings. So not only uh, office buildings or housing, the theaters, the courthouse, uh, etc. I think it's very important to us to mix. Often architects get very uh, they're good at social housing or they're good at uh, office buildings, and they do that. Try not to do that. Try to be as a good architect can do any building. I think. It's, the architect should. should have a problem for every solution. And you can hire specialists, specialist consultants to help you build that hospital, or to help you build the stadium. But an architect can think about space. I think you should do that. Um, our office hopefully reflects a bit uh, that, uh, that mix idea. We are about 40 people. Um, I'm very proud of our team. Uh, 40 people of the 19 nationalities. Uh, they mostly all speak three or four languages, so it's quite uh, interesting. But they all bring something from their background, they all bring something from their culture or their education. And when we design something, that, that's the interesting part. So everybody brings something to the table that really works. And so, also, I'd like to thank my team because uh, we're doing this all together and I couldn't have done anything uh, without it. I would also like to thank you uh, for being here. I wish you all the luck with your new year uh, coming up. Uh, it's exciting. And, uh, yeah.
space uh, next week. As if they don't have enough to do. We have time for some questions. Anybody have a question? And I know about Ichu, like the material you're using. I was wondering if they're gonna, um, they're like mimicking, you know, like construction, because I know the valley, the sacred valley in Cusco also has a lot of uh, development for like housing as well. Is there something that maybe other architects are thinking about it? To do this? Okay. Yeah, that type of insulation with the Ichu. This, I was very interested. This research is. Uh, it's not out there. Oh, okay. We're just trying to build it from last week, I think. So this is the first time that we show it. We're still testing it. But yeah, it's available. I hope it's not a okay. no one painting. No, it's really good because there's a lot of ichu in that area, <laughs> and they need more insulation. So it's very interesting. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I think when we left, when I left on the piano, I didn't want to fall in the track of use. He has a very perfect style of representation. In fact, 
I really didn't want to use other than the model making it does. Uh, but, so you're looking for your identity. You start looking for what, what should we do with it? How can we uh, do it? So the first few, first year, the first two years, we really uh, experimented with a lot of stuff. Uh, we let people do what they wanted and how they felt it. And, um, I'm quite free. I, the, the teams are very, um, I think, uh, independent. So I'm more uh, a curator of ideas than that I'm imposing uh, my ideas to, to the art. So when they come up with a beautiful idea of representing something, I just embrace it. I think we're still having different types of, uh, of rendering, or depending on the team, depending on people that work on it. So there's not uh, one style to the office, but it's getting a bit more settled. In the sense, we now oh, we did this project, can we do it again? We just entered the competition in Seoul this week, and we did the same style that we did another time because everybody could work to it. Um, it's, it's something very important to, your, to the art of practice. But I think it's very difficult to just say, okay, this is going to be it. You know, it's, it's something you have to develop. It's a language you, you, you do. And sometimes it's developed because of the project. It needs this very simple, very, like for the, for the counters, for the buildings concept hall, it was all about wood, it was all about human scale. And so the, the renderings were very soft and very uh, same character. Takes time. Um, how has your relationship changed from client and project and team as going from a one man shop to a 40 person company where your involvement has had to really work in the way that you participated with your coworkers and with your client and with the project and the design itself? Can you speak to that process and how you've grown in five years? Um, yeah, my, my first client is, is Alphonse Liu, who is my client at the Earth Week, and he's become a good friend. And, um, a lot of my time still goes into the project. The client relationship I had with them then, and I was among them then, I still have with them. We, we travel a lot together, we go for, look for concepts, we go to live, we think about ideas. And I think that, that for me is, a, is, a, is quite an intense relationship, but it's also the way why you want to in the end, or the relationship we had before with Peter Zumba, I think. And you develop and you, you get multiple projects and you have also people that are capable of handling a project and talking to clients and instead it's for themselves as relationships. So for example, uh, my, my team, I have, uh, I have seven people that are project leaders and, and they, they have their own uh, connection to the client and I'm much more than that. So that's natural and I think it's good. And we go on the level of team, I think we're still quite horizontal, and I hope to keep it that way. So, although we have grown very fast to 40, I hope to stabilize somewhere between 40 and 60, and you know, to get to 200. Somebody in my team did it. I can only straight away stop because this is not. I, even if you it was a developer team, right? But it's a developer team. But that part of it, and it's yeah, like it must be developer, of course. Yeah. And then, and then you, you had to but step out. I had to step out of it. I had to distance it myself because this is a practice I really, really don't agree with. It. So you're only way it up. Otherwise, that reputation follows, right? Yeah. Very small scale project. So um, I was wondering, could you like to share more experience when you first 
jump into another different scale of the project? In which project? In which scale? Um, like, so, for example, like, what I was doing, like, um, like, big scale of the project, but then suddenly I jump into a, you know, very small scale project. So, how do you go from the fabric to the, uh, the temporary bamboo pavilion? Is that a question? Is that yeah, what you're yeah, asking? How do you shift gears to do that? I think the approach is always the same. The approach is always the same to every project. The uh, intensity of uh, doing it, the research you're doing, and the model making, if it's a very small project that doesn't make any money, or a big project with a lot of responsibility and a lot of things going on, you can always try to do as much as possible. So there's projects that are making more money than the others do. Uh, and so you, you, the way you approach a project is always the same, you do always the same intensity. And you, you, you follow the way of analyzing, and making models, uh, starting, uh, starting to analyze the site and the surroundings and do your research. And that's for the small project, the same as for the big one. Um, Big one, of course, you, you, you find yourself quite fast in a team with lots of consultants and clients and to do the first workshops and to design. And the small ones, maybe it's only your team that's doing it with the client. The approach is still the same. some kind of interest in doing also that. Because uh, well, now I'm 40 and I'm trying to start hiring an IT manager. When you're 20, you don't have really money for an IT manager. You can do it outside, but you, you don't really want to, so you want to control it. And when something goes wrong, you want to know it. And so you have to also know about that. But then I also have to know about finance. And they don't teach you the market, actually, the finance. They don't teach you we can't teach you everything. No, <laughs> so you jump into the deep. And yeah, when you go fast, it's, it's a bit more of a rush. It's nice. Be brave. I've got one question, kind of an ethical one. Um, how do you sell the client going for a more sustainable approach? You see a lot of projects have that sort of aspect. And how do you convince them that it's, I mean, it's not just, you know, I don't know, a lot of our proposals encourage us to have a reason behind it and stuff like that, and not just slap solar panels on something just because it's good. You know, how do you how do you reason through it and convince a client that it's the right thing to do? Um, I think um, first of all it is, it's just part of our architecture so we come there you know, and you're and you're well, also you show the work and he comes to you and he knows that you're doing this research and he knows that you're working on it. So when you talk to them about it, they are convinced of it. I think we are, I'd be very lucky, or we'd be very lucky that our clients wanted it. They, they came to us also telling it. I mean, the client from Milford, he wants to be this carbon neutral. He wants, he, he invests so much money on this project, uh, making it sustainable. He, uh, it almost uh, generates its own, uh, all its own heating and cooling inside. It's all uh, solar panels. It's very, it's a very sustainable project, and it's all driven by him. And it's, it's very difficult to make a, a monument, a monumental building, 
sustainable and still try to design it when we want to design it. Yeah, with the steel and bars and, and the concrete going inside. But he was pushing for us to be really on, a, on the top level of sustainability. So we've been very lucky that we had a lot of clients, even also in, in Peru, that he wanted to, he was all for this. Sorry? It's hard. You have to understand how important clients are. Yeah. Great projects are always involved great with clients. great clients. Anything else? Hunter. Um, so you talked about using the hemp crate and the edge crate. Yep. How you're researching that. I was wondering, because I'm possibly going to want to write a thesis on that. I was wondering what you found in that, the pros and cons, other than using regular installation compared to but well, if you look at the history of Ancrete, and Ancrete is built in uh, France, uh, it's used in France since 600, I think. Um, and they still find those buildings. I think the durability of Ancrete is proven over the years. It doesn't have to be used for it. The technology is very ancient to use mud or hand and do it. So it's an old technology which, which can be done. Um, the, the, the good thing about hemp is that it, 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 it's, um, it, it mixes very well with, uh, with the, uh, uh, the lime. Um, we're not so sure but yet about itch, so we're, we're testing that. And that's something that's the, the character, characteristics of the plant. Uh, but we all know this, but we're testing it very quickly. It, it, it's a, it's a, research is always a big experiment. You go on a route and it's, it's, it's an adventure. You don't know where you end, but you, you have this idea in mind and you have to go to the left or the right. In the end, you, you hope to get there. It's a bit exploring far, far less. What do you find? Hey, um, Spark, I'm going to, unless there's a pertinent question, anybody else just been waiting to ask a question? Um, I really, I was really excited to have you visit and, and talk to students about <coughs> starting your own office and what that means. We often get speakers here who have, you know, 30 year practice or something and they really show beautiful things, but it's, it's close, right? It's, you know, these students are thinking about their futures and so I really, really love the presentation. I also wanted to add something you said to me, uh, which was the 40 people, 19 nations, and in the last year, seven babies. So you've got you know, all these young people in the office, of course, and we were just talking, and it was like, oh, and seven babies, you put seven this babies year. on it. Do I? This year. This year, this seven year. babies. This year, seven babies. So doesn't it just sound like a great place to work? I mean, it's like I want to, Drop 30 years and run that direction immediately, but it doesn't work that way. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.